This is uh, part two of the Purdue Oral Histories Program's uh, interview with Dr. Robert Strickler. Uh, today is October 9th, 2015. Thank you again, Dr. Strickler, for uh, agreeing to interview again. Oh, you're welcome. Pleased to be here. Um, I want to start out uh, our this part two of this interview, um, picking up on uh, your career. Okay. Um, so the, the first question we wanted to ask, um, could you talk a, a bit about the expertise that you contributed during the SALT talks? Um, what exactly was at issue and what technical expertise on your part could you? Okay, the, uh, the issue uh, at the time was uh, what is a st strategic weapon and what is not a strategic weapon? And it turns out that uh, this is a term actually defined by the United States, strategic. In, in the view of the Soviets, they wouldn't choose to use the word strategic because all weapons are, are of, in play. In other words, we were trying to define uh, strategic as being uh, missiles that fly a certain range. For the Soviets, if you're thinking, looking at it from the Soviet point of view, uh, the, the distance from their launch points to Paris or London is considerably different than, than ours from uh, uh, silo fields in North Dakota to Moscow. So that was the main issue. One of the main issues is getting is defining what it, what are we talking about in terms of missiles, and what are we talking about in terms of uh, uh, size of uh, warheads and how many warheads are on each missile. And so that became, uh, the definitions became the, 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 uh, the fundamental issue to begin with. And uh, <coughs> expertise that I, I could bring or did bring to it was how could, how could anyone cheat? In other words, uh, just because a missile had uh, 10 warheads today, does that mean you couldn't put 40 on it tomorrow? Uh, and uh, it turns out, uh, in some instances, you could. Uh, and so that needed to be articulated. So going back again to the language yeah. and making sure. All right. And so people that understood this. I mean, the people doing the negotiations were not, uh, uh, well, technical people. That's, uh, people in charge of the negotiations were not technical people. They had clearly help with people who were technical. Now, you, what was my role on? I was not involved in the negotiations. That's done by the State Department. And so, and remember, I worked in the Senate, and I worked <coughs> on, the, uh, on the Armed Services Committee staff. The, the staff responsible for advi so-called advice and consent on the treaty was the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. However, uh, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee was going down a path that we, we on the House Armed Services, or not the House, on the Senate Armed Services Committee thought was not correct. And so we chose to take our own view. Could of, you explain that a little bit? Well, I'd rather not explain oh, okay. <laughs> it. Okay. It's, 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 it's okay. very political. Uh, okay. uh, to be blunt about it, I guess the, the, the feeling on the Senate Armed Services Committee was that the uh, Foreign Relations Committee was folding over uh, and to sign, get a treaty signed without worrying about uh, what I was talking about, how people can cheat and that, right. that sort of thing. And so we were very interested in, in having something that could stand the right. common sense test, is this good or for the country or not? And so we did our own assessment of the treaty, we the uh, Senate Arms, uh, Armed Services Committee. And that was a, a brave new thing at the time because it, it really took the underpinnings out of the Foreign Relations Committee. And as a matter of fact, we, we were successful with a report we wrote and got the Senate to approve it. So. Uh, and you were under time pressure, I'm sure. Oh yeah, we were under time <laughs> pressure. <laughs> Did you work with 
with the old greats like Scoop Jackson? Uh, I worked with, uh, yes, that was, and I'm glad you said that because it, this was a different time than what you see in the press today. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, in, in the Democrats and the Republicans worked closely together on issues that were of national interest. Jackson is a, a good example. Another one is Gary Hart. Both of them uh, Democrats. Sam Nunn. Sam, Sam Nunn was yeah. a was a became quite a friend of, of John Warner, who I worked for, and and uh, very very similar ideologies. And I'm glad you raised that point. And uh, Scoop Jackson was really the the leader of the Democrats. In the, in the sense of worrying about uh, what I call World War III issues. And, uh, and he had quite a staff of people. Many of them incidentally became uh, Republican staffers uh, for George Bush and uh, were instrumental in the Iraqi war. Uh, uh, Richard Pearl is a, is a for example case. And uh, these neocons. Uh, that's what they're came called. Out of they, Scoop, Scoop Jackson's yeah, office. They do. And I, I won't say all of them did. But some of them. Are. Some Richard of the key ones did. Mm -hmm. How about Paul Nitze? Did you ever have any? Yes. Yeah. I've. Uh, I've. I've briefed him on the, on, on this, this sort of thing, and uh, he he was a he was a good guy. In my view, he was a good guy. He listened. He listened. Uh, I Warner had me another figure at the time, like Nitzi, was a guy named Paul Warnke, who was uh, uh, sort of on the on the, what you might call the dovish side of the issue, and uh, so for some reason or another, Sam Nunn was supposed to debate him on a public forum on. C-SPAN or I forgot what it was, uh, some, some people, either that or PBS, and so Warner sent me over to uh, get Sam Nunn prepared <laughs> to do that, which I did. And, uh, you crossed aisles. Oh yeah. That wouldn't happen today. No, it wouldn't happen today, but I, I think that's important to know that that's the way people work. Well, you work for the committee. I worked for I worked for I worked for Warner, who, because he was the committee, mm -hmm. or, uh, put me on the committee staff. I see. So uh, that was a, I had an office in both places, in his office and on the committee staff. But it seems you also felt you didn't just work for him; you worked for the committee and therefore the country. And yeah. There was a sense of national. Yeah. Spirit. No, I I didn't worry about. Uh, to you know Chrysler dealers, which was a big deal at the time. I didn't I didn't worry about his legislature. I mean that stuff. So the only thing I did for him was with defense issues. I was not involved in his day to day Virginia issues at all. I, I would not have taken the job had I been asked to do that. Wasn't interested in doing that. Doing that. What was it like working with him? Uh, it was, uh, I think the thing that uh, was amazing to me is how hard they do work. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, as we discussed, he was married, married to Elizabeth Taylor at the time. And, uh, you know, she was a night person and, and he worked, he worked until, uh, oh, maybe eight o'clock every night uh, in the office. And, and then and then went home, and uh, and that was that was quite uh, routine uh, for most senators and uh, congressmen at that time. I, I can't speak to what they do today because I'm I, I'm not there. But it was a it was a time absorbing job for him, I'm sure. Uh, it's been said, here's another question, it's been said um, by some that um, 
President Carter's Department of Defense under Harold Brown was innovative and forward-thinking. Would you agree with that? I agree with that, and uh, had uh, I very much agree with that. And uh, one of the, one of my admissions, or one of the things I worry about that I did is uh, Warner asked me to. He was asked to write, or he was asked to draft the. Uh, platform for the Republican Convention in 1980, the defense platform. And so he asked me to do it, and I did it. And I told him at the time, and so just so you're not embarrassed, Senator Warner, I'm a registered Democrat in California, and that's on record, and people, people I don't want you to be embarrassed when people discover that, they say you didn't care. So I wrote the thing, but I never mentioned the word Republican, and I never mentioned the other word Democrat. I, it was just a United States of America uh, defense platform, in my view. Mm -hmm. uh, now the unfortunate thing <laughs> with respect to Carter is that he didn't win. <laughs> uh, but uh, true enough, uh, all of the things that uh, uh, Reagan is given credit for in the so-called defense buildup, were, was really developing systems or putting in the field systems developed by Harold Brown and Bill Perry. Uh, Bill Perry was also a vice president of TRW, so I knew him. Harold Brown has been a consultant for me, so I know, I know, uh, I know Harold Brown. Those are good men and uh, really smart guys. And, um, we had this, some significant initiatives during that time. Uh, I guess I, I'll just, well, I won't say what they were. Uh, but some significant initiatives at that time that have, uh, were deployed in the later years and helped us win the Cold War. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, all the, all the things that uh, others have given credit for were really, were really developed in the Harold Brown, Bill Perry era. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess I think sometimes people think of a switch is flipped and yeah. there you have something no. that often takes years. No. Of Bill, Bill Perry must have been a Republican because he went on to work for Reagan. It didn't matter there. It didn't either. matter there. He, uh, I don't know that he was a Republican. Uh, I don't think he was. I think he, I think he was a Democrat. Mm -hmm. uh, Bill Perry uh, had an organization that we TRW had called ESL, which was in Sunnyvale, mm -hmm. Electronic Systems Lab. And uh, John Deutsch was another one. He, uh, he also was a consultant for me on one, uh, when I was doing this nuclear waste program. And he, uh, he also was a part of that era. Brown, Perry, and Deutsch. Following up on um, the what the buildup after the Carter administration, um, how did the new military buildup under Reagan after 1980 revolutionize the nuclear balance, especially with new technologies? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I think uh, you know. Let me be honest about it. I think that uh, Reagan killed the programs that I was working on at the time. Uh, the ICBM program was essentially decimated. Under uh, Perry and Brown, or Brown and Perry, we would have had uh, 200 MX missile systems in 3,200 shelters in the, in the Southwest. Under Reagan, the program was reduced to having 50 MX missiles in old Minuteman silos, which are highly, well, uh, which are targetable, let me put it that way. Uh, so it ruined the whole, the ICBM program was essentially uh, destroyed, mm -hmm. to use a word. Maybe, maybe that's an oversimplification problem, but uh, uh, they tended to rely upon uh, the Trident missile systems and the submarine systems, 
uh, which have their own vulnerabilities but not discussed. And I'm not going to discuss it here. <laughs> Understood. Um, you had an amazing career at TOW um, and saw the height of the Strategic Defense Initiative. Um, did you have faith in it? Well, that's an interesting. Uh, uh, that's an interesting question here, and I'll, I'll I'll tell you what the story, what the answer. What, what let me tell you a few anecdotes to to the answer. Uh, in uh, nineteen March twenty third, nineteen eighty three, Reagan gave this speech, uh, which said uh, his goal was to render nuclear ballistic missiles impotent and obsolete. Here I was running the ICBM program, and the President of the United States said, I want to render nu nuclear ballistic missiles impotent and obsolete. And so I said, well, okay, uh, we know how to attack the Soviet Union. That's what I've been doing since I was, you know, started uh, and, and, and uh, countered the defense systems they had, which were formidable, incidentally. Uh, and so I, let's figure out how we can protect our country. So I took on that job, and, uh, and uh, the uh, Defense Department came up with this notion of having what they called a, a horse race contract competition, uh, where they would, uh, in uh, call all the contractors into Washington and say, we want you to figure out how to band together and, and uh, essentially provide means to satisfy the Reagan objective of rendering Soviet nuclear ballistic missiles impotent and obsolete. And uh, so that became, some people called it Star Wars, uh, and it had a variety of names. Anyway, there were, <coughs> uh, and this was a meeting we had at the uh, the State Department, and uh, there were about uh, I don't know several hundred people there. We formed, we came to form about twenty five teams uh, of contractors to do to go after this. Almost no funding. I forgot what the funding was. It was piddly. It's like a million dollars, which is not a lot of money to do. Uh, studies with, uh, uh, you know, significant horsepower. So it's really, these were really corporate investments. Uh, our team uh, was winnowed down to be one of the top ten, and then we, at the end of the day we were the top one. And so we won the horse race, and, uh, and out of that we didn't even get a, a wreath of roses. <laughs> uh, out of that, we uh, we got a thank you very much, Bob. You did a good job, uh, type type thing. And uh, but you know that's okay. We planted a bunch of ideas. Now, if you ask me, will it work? And because uh, I was asked uh, to to brief people, uh, so I met on Christmas Eve with George Schultz, who was Secretary of State, one on one, to to answer the question that you just asked. Does this thing really work? And I told him, no, uh, there's no such thing as zero leakage, you know, there's no such thing as a perfect system. So as, it's like you, were, you and I were talking about the Challenger uh, things uh, uh, at the outset, and uh, there, there's no such thing as perfect. And, uh, in, the, and in this case, it would be actually far from that. And, uh, but we had a, we came up with a system which had about seven layers of defense and uh, would have, would have uh, presented a very formidable challenge uh, to, for any, any aggressor to get a nuclear warhead on, uh, on the United States soil. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt about that, that I would not tell anyone that uh, it would be perfect. Mm -hmm. And if you remember, you know, you're not old enough to remember, but the, uh, uh, I remember when I went to California in 68, the uh, Volkswagen uh, minibus or microbus bumper stickers, one nuclear bomb will ruin your whole day. That's true. 
one nuclear bomb will ruin your whole day. So uh, it's important to, to, to understand that even if you have a defense system that gets 99.9% uh, .9 of the warheads removed from the skies, the one that comes down is going to ruin somebody's whole day. So that's the way it is to answer your question more or worry. And, uh, and the system was never really developed. It's, it's still not developed. And uh, the approach taken today is banding, banding together uh, existing uh, technologies or systems, Aegis cruisers and things like that. And it's, it's not the system that we envisioned or would, would uh, stand behind as being a uh, a uh, competent uh, defense system against an all-out attack. Mm -hmm. Now, it, you know, it's, it would be uh, probably work against onesies and twosies from uh, North Korea or accidental launches from a Soviet squadron or something like that, but not a all-out, you know, Armageddon. So Schultz was more of a free thinker in that administration. Did yeah. You ever, did you ever have close contact with Casper Weinberger? Uh, I've only I met him a couple of times, but I uh, he's not in the same. Well, uh, to answer your question, no. Let me answer it that way. Did you meet George Schultz at the State Department? Was it a professional meeting? No, it was a meeting where he asked me to brief him on uh, uh, we, uh, where we met was. He was, uh, he was doing uh, Christmas in uh, uh, somewhere in Palo Alto, and uh, I was here in, uh, Los, uh, here. I was in Los Angeles, uh, and he asked me to come up and visit him, and so we went out to Livermore Labs, and we're in a secure vault, you know, the two of us in a, in a, uh, in a, in a room. And uh, spent and then uh, spent the time going over all the material. Did you get back home for Christmas Day? No, I went skiing and uh, <laughs> met my sons in uh, Salt Lake City. Good. And uh, that's what we did. It's an interesting place. Yeah. Where you could go from a secret vault at Lawrence Livermore to skiing. And yeah. I'm sure George Schultz went back swimming. Or whatever. Yeah, whatever he does, right? <laughs> Cold War environment, um, was it different in the 80s under Reagan, and then how did it change after the collapse of the USSR? Well, uh, I guess, uh, you know, I, uh, I'm i probably what's called a dinosaur. Uh, I don't believe it's ended, uh, but that's, uh, that's another another story. Uh, it's, uh, it's just gone a different direction. It, uh, mm -hmm. I always, to answer your question, uh, I always felt that if we could get, get through 1985 without the uh, Soviets uh, doing something, we were, we were going to be okay. And I said that maybe in 1975, because I see what the, what the forces were and what the developments were on both sides. And, I felt it was going to take until 1985 for us to have a firmly superior hand. And that turned out to be true. Uh, it took until 1989 or so before Gorbachev, you know, pulled the plug on what they were doing. And I think one of the, <coughs> one of the things that's, uh, that's always bothered me is that we were never prepared to win, win the Cold War. In fact, <clears throat> most of the problems that we have today are because we didn't, we never planned on winning the Cold War. We planned on fighting the Cold War, mm. uh, <laughs> but we never planned on winning it, And uh, which is curious. You think about the uh, World War II, uh, we, we aided Germany. The Marshall Plan, I mean, we, we just... Uh, here, here we were attacked and there were horrible consequences by, uh, on the United States and our allies due to the Germans. 
But we had a plan of how to reunite. Same with Japan. Uh, here we dropped atomic bombs and uh, so that we could, uh, you know, go in and, and get an unconditional surrender without losing perhaps a, a million American lives. And after the, that, why we rallied and uh, became firm allies with Japan in our trade. You know, trade was significant immediately. Let's say within five years after the end of the Second World War. Here we and with the Soviet Union, it just came in, almost like it just caught us off completely off guard. And I can't. It's you look back at that and you wonder why? Why on earth did we not have a plan on what to do if uh, if the wall came down and uh, and uh, we were able to have. Uh, reasonable discussions with the Soviet leader, uh, which in this case was Gorbachev. And I don't know what the, maybe you know, but yeah, I, I, don't know what say, the, I don't know what the answer is. What are your thoughts on that, both of you? <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, because I didn't expect it either. But when I got my first job in 1991, uh, teaching uh, Russian history, mm -hmm. I predicted the Soviet Union would continue to last because of Gorbachev's uh, New treaty, his new federal treaty to yeah. revive the Soviet Union. And I'd been taught for 10 years previous, as you said, um, to fight the war on a kind of academic, intellectual level. Yeah. And never imagined the Soviet Union's collapse mm -hmm. and what came after. Yeah. So, you know, I wrote this question down. Did we even have a plan? Yeah, I don't think uh, we I'm did. I'm going to look for it if we did. Yeah. I have no I don't knowledge imagine of that the U.S. was prepared at all. I don't think we were. Even towards the end. Yeah, and and, and the end came with uh, George H. W. Bush, who was really a very good guy. Uh, but I don't think he saw it uh, coming either. If he did, it was I don't know what he did. And we we just kind of came across comes across to me as we were totally unprepared and. Uh, most of the problems we have today is because we didn't exit that correctly at the time. And I think the you know, the people right people were in the right place at the time to have done that. Bush being one and Gorbachev being the other, uh, to have done something that would have been lasting today. Anyway, I'm not gonna solve that problem. I just mm -hmm. race is, is an issue. Yeah. Well, even there, agreements on uh, strategic arms limitations from those years, the first Bush and Gorbachev, have now withered yeah, with Putin's that's, yeah, that's true. Um, that's true. invasion of Ukraine. Yeah, that's true. So even there, solid efforts and meaningful efforts uh, failed Yeah. to that extent. We're getting pessimistic here. We've got to <laughs> yeah. find something upbeat. Yeah. Well, I was just trying to answer your question, Tracy, about uh, what happened. I, I don't know what happened. Yeah. Uh, did you work with the Russians to demilitar demilitarize during those years? Were you involved in that? No, part the of only thing that I did, which was sort of curious, uh, a former Secretary of the Air Force, Tom Reed, asked me to host uh, some Soviet leaders at TRW. Uh, and I was very nervous about doing this because he wanted uh, me to show them how our uh, early warning system worked and how our launch control system worked, the missiles and all that. So About when was this? Uh, in this time period. I don't know the exact date. And I don't want to yeah. uh, uh, say, <laughs> say more than I should. But right. it was, uh, and so it was... I hired a translator because I don't speak Russian. I took Russian here, but certainly don't speak it. And, uh, and so I hired a translator so I could deal with these people and uh, come out to uh, Los Angeles, Redondo Beach, and set up a series of briefings where we showed them ours and they were supposed to show us theirs. And, and uh, anyway, it was a good, good interchange in, uh, in the spirit of things. But it was uh, uh, that's my only 
formal interaction with the Soviets, to answer your question, that was the reason mm -hmm. I brought this up. Mm -hmm. yeah, but it was, uh, you know, it was a sanctioned event. There was a CIA representative there, and uh, I'm sure he was CIA uh, watching what was going on. So mm -hmm. it was uh, hard because uh, I had to get these people in the building, the classified building. And they smoked, and you know, policy in California is no smoking in buildings at the time. And these guys didn't understand that at all. And uh, I said, you, yeah, you, we have to. You, if you want to, you know, to translate, if you want to smoke, you got to go outside. Well, they couldn't read exit on the, or emergency exit on doors, so they're opening all these doors to go outside and sending off alarms. <laughs> it was uh, quite a quite a scene. <laughs> yeah. One's nervous to begin with. <laughs> I'm interested that you learned Russian here at Purdue. I, I, I recall Dr. Zucco asked his students, his PhD students certainly, maybe his MA too, that that was one of the requirements to graduate. Well, uh, it was, uh, I'm not sure, it w I guess you're right, because uh, we all took Russian. I didn't know it was a requirement we, uh, to graduate. We had to take a foreign language. Mm -hmm. and, and uh, part of the deal, we used to have, uh, we used to do classified work at the rocket lab. And part of the work was uh, translating Soviet literature. I did that, I didn't know. Yeah. And you did that. I did that. That explains why over in their library there are some old, there are quite a number of old um, publications in Russian. Yeah, that's exactly Technical right. Technical publications. That's exactly right. But these were, these were not that, those kind of publications. These yeah. were so more, you know, Current at the time, pub, um, writings. Let me put it that way. Mm -hmm. Publications would be implied as a magazine or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's what we did uh, to uh, part of our uh, as part of our work. Hmm. I'm impressed. It's not easy to translate. No, it, it, technical it, Russian even. Well, technical Russian to me was the, is was easy because they put it was a uh, Russianized or Sovietized a bunch of American words yeah. uh, and the, the technical literature is perhaps easier than normal stuff but you know it, tough. It, it, admittedly the way that we did it was almost like using a, a Captain Midnight secret decoder or something I didn't speak Russian uh, could not have a conversation in Russian uh, couldn't write Russian. I decoded Russian, so I had a Russian English dictionary, and this stuff and uh, and the words. It was just like using a decoder, so it was really. And you understood those case endings. Yeah, it, you have probably I, a code for that too. Yeah, as best I could. I, I'm not going to tell you I understood it <laughs> because that's that's not that's not the truth of the matter. But that wasn't the requirement. The requirement was to try to. Make sense out of this. What are they? What are they? What's being said here? What are they talking about? I did you Did that. you feel you accomplished that? Yeah, you know, I did. Uh, he must have proofread because he he he. Uh, I don't know what he Zucro had to do with it. Quite frankly, right. I mean, I'm sure he had something to do with it. But I did this and gave it to the secretary, and that was the end of it, as far as I knew. I don't know what. <laughs> Where it went. Where <laughs> he was fluent in Russian, so he, yeah. he must have been able to very quickly yeah. read what could, he did and ensure that it was correct. It could be. Mm -hmm. could well, be. Wasn't he well known for proofreading and marking? Oh up? yeah, but uh, I've never had anything come back on on that. From those uh, translations, right? Hmm. It's interesting. So. Yeah, one of the books I found over there in the library is a Russian uh, uh, English technical tra uh, dictionary yeah, translation from like nineteen. 40 or 50. Yeah. Or and maybe he was just giving me pop quizzes. I don't know. <laughs> you know I, I honestly don't know. Uh, I know what I was asked to do and what I did and gave it to the secretary and that was the end of it. Interesting. <laughs> um, okay. Um, what one technological or management achievement do you remember with most pride? I'm sorry to spring this on you. I should have. Uh, actually, the uh, the management achievement was probably this uh, missile defense thing, winning this horse race. Even though uh, at the time it was a big deal to me and to the company, even though we got no 
money out of it. Yeah, we we did get a lot of uh, credit for it, and uh, you know, as as I said, I was I was asked to uh, by by the government to brief uh, uh, Secretary of State one on one. I was asked to brief Manfred Berner one on one, who was the NATO uh, chair. Uh, I was asked to brief uh, members of Congress. I would come back and be the government's representative to brief the uh, program, what they called at that time SDI, to uh, to Congress. So I was I was very proud of what we did, and I always presented. If anybody questioned me, like you were, about how does it really work, I was always quite honest in saying, you know, what the pitfalls were, mm -hmm. this, that, the other. But th that was the mm -hmm. thing I was, uh, the most, I took most pride in. It was the most fun job I had uh, at, uh, in the workplace. Mm -hmm. What made it fun? Well, uh, what made it fun was because uh, I put a team together out of nothing. I mean, we had, you know, I was asked to do this, and uh, I was working in, in San Bernardino on, at the time on uh, missile systems, on uh, ICBM systems, and I went into LA and pulled together the resources of the company uh, to do this. and. Uh, I was able to get uh, people who had worked on uh, various intelligent uh, space assets that uh, gather intelligence, let me put it that way, and uh, other parts of the company to put together put a, put, uh, a good team that was able to do this, and then uh, hire some other contractors who had particular expertise. For example, the uh, people that uh, at that time, the people who uh, were had a lot of uh, uh, well, publicity in the Navy circles were the guys at uh, RCA, which became GE, which who knows what it is now, uh, which uh, developed the Aegis Cruiser fire control system, and so they were brought them on the team, and. Uh, gave us some in insight into how how that worked. And uh, we, had, we just had a, a good, it was about a two years work, worth of work to do that. So it sounds like you had complete freedom to, and creativity oh, yeah. to just, yeah, and, and the resources to gather yeah, the resources you needed. It was company money and the company stood, be, you know, stood behind me, brought in whoever I wanted as a consultant. Uh, Ed, Edward Teller, Teller came down and was a consultant for me from Livermore. He was a, what was he like? He was he was really a, a piece of work. Let me put it. <laughs> he's a fascinating guy. He he has the uh, interesting assessment. There's no such thing as a secret, which bothers me. Because I I come from working in a very classified world all my life, and here a guy is that you know. Uh, was a leader in developing the nuclear weapons. Uh, says that there's no such thing as a secret. And uh, anyway, so you know, when you go through your ideas with him, it's from the standpoint of how he relates that to his own personal war stories. But he has good insight. Harry had good insight into what the situation was, and it was important. That he listened or listened or understood what we did because he was the guy that actually got Reagan excited about the the concept in the first place. He had this notion. In fact, a guy there, a little more named Lowell Wood, had this notion of creating X-ray lasers, which could be space-based and shoot down uh, incoming uh, uh, reentry objects. Uh, now, whether that is realizable or not uh, is not not the case here. It's not uh, was it was never part of our solution. Um, so anyway, he was he was interested in what we were doing and uh, seeing seeing how the real world operates as opposed to a more fancy one. Do you know? Do you know? Yeah. 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 Yeah
his point about <coughs> no such thing as a secret was a cautionary to you? No, it was just uh, he was amazed that I was uh, I, I regarded uh, these things as uh, secret or classified, and which it turns out that uh, well I shouldn't go into this. Uh, I, I don't want to go into this. It's he, he was a man of science. He, he might have been thinking in those broad terms, like Tracy said, the theory. Yeah. He may have been, been thinking back to Los Alamos too, and how those secrets yeah. didn't stay secret long. Yeah. It, it could. It could be. Be. He was a creative thinker as well. Like he was said. very creative. Yeah. Yeah. He he uh, he was telling the story about how the how the message was carried to Roosevelt about the uh, atomic uh, weapon in the first place, and he was part of that uh, team that went there uh, to uh, deliver the message, so to speak, that the Nazis are developing a weapon and then we should also and so that's you know that's one of his war stories is talking about driving the car that took the Fermi and others to mm -hmm. oh that's right see, see one of them couldn't drive yeah and he had the car <laughs> yeah yeah <gasps> there were a lot of World War II stories yeah in those days everyone seemed to have one yeah Um, how about we switch gears, um, yeah. and can I ask you about um, your small town roots? Okay. Um, we had a question, um, did you notice many of your engineer colleagues with similar small town roots? Sure. Uh, yeah. uh, a lot of them, I think. I think that's, uh, that's here at Purdue, that's uh, particularly true. Now, I think if one were to, if you were at, at, say, Stanford or at MIT, you would not, I, I suspect you would not find that to be the case. But part of the attraction of Purdue University in itself is because uh, it, it appeals to people like me who are from a, a small town, uh, as opposed to something that comes across as very urban or, or glitzy or whatever. And Purdue is not urban and not glitzy. It's a step. <laughs> it's a step towards yeah. that outer, that that world beyond, maybe. Um, well, I never thought of it that kids. way. I never, I never worried about the world beyond Purdue. Uh, I mean, uh, when I when I came to school here, I mean, to me, this was the world. I, uh, I had no notion about where it would lead after that. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a matter of fact, I became. You know, you know, if there were a career opportunity would have been there to be a teacher at a university as mm -hmm. opposed to a researcher, I would have been very interested in doing that. Mm -hmm. But it turns out that that's, uh, that's not a career path, at least here and I don't know about other places. Uh, I, did, uh, I did interview for jobs after I started in industry because uh, I, I became concerned about uh, working in industry uh, through and after I got my PhD because I had this experience when I started working that I was the program was shifted out from under me and I worked on another field mm -hmm. and I worried about that and so I thought gee maybe the thing to do is uh, go back to what I wanted to do in the first place which was be a university teaching professor and uh, so I looked into that and had a couple of opportunities. Uh, uh, one of them was in, uh, well, I shouldn't say where they were, but they were in places I, th I think it would have been very difficult moves for my family, let me put it that way. And so, and, and I thought, gee, once you're there in a university, you're stuck. It's not like uh, the industrial world where there are all kinds of moving expenses paid and this and that and the other. You're there, and if you, if it doesn't work out, you're on your own, so to speak, to move someplace else. So uh, I, I didn't didn't take the university jobs and stuck with industry. Mm -hmm. It seems at the time that that's where the demand was, though, for people with your experience in industry. Well, so actually, uh, no. Uh, sh sh shortly after I started in uh, 
uh, in 68, it must have been in the early 70s, you had cab drivers who were postal diggers, peace, peace. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it was a, there was a, a significant downturn. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In, in, uh, in, in this particular type of thing that I was doing. I know you have a busy day. Yeah. So I don't want to tax you no. too much. I'll ask you again, is there any questions we didn't ask that you wish we had about, about this area? Uh, well, let's see. I assume that you're going to be asking people about, uh, uh, that you talk with about what the Rocket Lab and or Purdue Aero School meant to them and uh, all that kind of stuff. Uh, I, you know, I, <coughs> I think that, uh, I think I, I maybe told you this, I've lost track of what I told you the other day, but it, uh, in terms of teachers, I, uh, the high school teachers I had, I can remember three or four high school teachers I had who changed my life in terms of getting me mo uh, bolstered and positioned me. Uh, to go into college, to be able to excel in, uh, in college. I don't have many memories uh, of good teachers here at Purdue. Now that, that may, may sound like a strange comment to make, but it's not a, t and that's one of the reasons I was interested in teaching, is because I, I felt that I could do that. Uh, it turns out uh, a lot, I think that I think that the university is uh, very concerned with having people write papers and uh, do this, that, and uh, bring in research dollars as opposed to being excellent teachers. Now, there are some teachers that are, are good. I can remember one or two uh, in Arrow that were quite good. Uh, I think you mentioned them. Yeah, you know, maybe I mentioned that. Yeah, Dr. Gustafson. Gustafson, Gustafson. Being, uh -huh. being the one I was thinking about primarily. Mm -hmm. But, uh, so I think that that's an issue for Purdue to wrestle with. I think the universities are going to change uh, dramatically whether bricks and mortar survive for 100 years or 50 years, who knows, whether we become distance learning whether you know, the competition is really the University of Phoenix and things like that, I mean, as strange as it may sound, but mm -hmm. uh, so we'll see. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's going to be easier to get an education because it's available on your on your computer as opposed to uh, classrooms, and so uh, the, the work, uh, how Purdue adjusts to this, I have no idea. But the lab. I didn't mean to get off on this tangent, but I, I'm just thinking about how 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 is this going to play out uh, over the over the next few years? Was it the curriculum then at Purdue and the high standards that shaped you into a, a top class aerospace engineer without the good teaching? Oh, I think I I, I don't 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 get me wrong. It's not that I we I didn't have bad teaching. I just had people who were uh, didn't see themselves as being teachers. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm trying to say. They're researchers coming to class mm -hmm. and sharing what they knew about a subject rather than leading you through it. Uh, I'm not sure I'm communicating mm -hmm. well, but I it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very different in. Think of it, the difference between high school and college, maybe. Yeah. High school, there's a tendency to make sure you understand this, yeah. you understand that. Mm -hmm. There's none of that here. I mean, not very little of that here. It's more, here it is, go do it, and or not. In your day or still to this day? I don't know. What I, even though I'm on different advisory councils today, mm -hmm. I don't really know today, but I suspect it's that way today also. In fact, I, I think it's even worse because uh, 
For example, uh, one of the one of the proposals here in, in the Aero School is to hire what they call practicing professors. I guess is what they call it, mm -hmm. which means that they have almost no research responsibilities, but their teaching responsibilities or networking with other department responsibilities, which I think is a good idea. Mm -hmm. But it's going to be very difficult to hire those people because of the way that the uh, it's stacked up against them, in my view. You have to have so many papers and so many presentations and so many awards and this and that and the other. I couldn't qualify uh, to do that. Cause I grew up in a world where we don't write papers. It's all classified, and so you don't write papers. Anything I did, you, there was no paper. Would you consider that a regression to have these practicing teachers who maybe don't offer the highest standard and demands on the students, but are more outreach oriented? No, I think it'd be good if they it's did a good that. Thing. I think it's a good thing. I at least have a balance between the two. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, yeah, obviously. Uh, I'm not saying go all that way, but I think you can do some and interconnecting the departments. Uh, you know, the, the stovepipes of electrical and mechanical and aero make, make no sense in the end of the day. You know, what I did as a career had almost nothing to do with what I was taught in school, to be honest with you. Yeah, but the thing that the school uh, classwork did is taught me how to learn and how to do other things. But if you look at the technologies I managed uh, and uh, and well, to manage them, I had to understand them and be able to do them. They were they covered the waterfront uh, and much broader than anything I ever took in coursework here. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Hope I didn't bore you. But no, <laughs> not at all. Oh, it's yours. Uh, it's mine, I guess. <laughs>